We're talking today with John Lutz of Gross Point Shores, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, John, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in Brooklyn, New York, on May the 24th, 1919. That puts me a little over 100 years old. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, did you live in Brooklyn, or where did you live when you were a kid? When I was a kid, uh, actually before Brooklyn, my mother went down to Brooklyn to have her baby, which was me. Mm -hmm. But actually, my mother and father were living in the Bronx, New York, mm -hmm. at that time. We were there for about four or five years and then moved to a house uh, in what they call Queens, which is another borough mm -hmm. of New York City. And I stayed in there until I went to college in, I went to MIT in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. All right. Uh, now, uh, what was your family doing for a living? What kind of job did your father have? My father was a manager of a uh, textile company in, uh, with headquarters in New York City, and manufacturing was done, I think it was in Passaic, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Queens. Do you remember which high school you attended? Yeah, Newtown High School, still in operation. All right. I still bring it up occasionally on uh, my computer to see what's going on there. Okay. And things are still going just the way I left them. All right. Uh, and what, what, when, when did you graduate? 1936, and that's when I went to college. Okay. So you were just 17 at that point? Yes. Okay. All right. And now, did you finish a year early, or...? Did you just time it right? Because normally you graduate, you, you start college at 18, but you were just, still just 17. Uh, anyway. Uh, I didn't time it, it was just, just the way it came okay. out. Okay, okay. Uh, now, why did you go to MIT? Well, basically, I guess it was, I always wanted to be an engineer. And I always wanted to be, go to the toughest school. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, my advisor in, uh, in high school, which always asked the students where they want to go, what they want to do. And when I mentioned to them that I wanted to go to MIT, I can still hear them laughing. And, uh, oh, you'll never get in there, that kind of a thing. And actually, I graduated from Newtown High School in Queens with an extremely high grade, average, which uh, got me right into MIT without any, uh, any further examinations. Okay. All right. So you were good enough after all. Well, was Newtown a good high school, as far as you can tell? Yes, at the time it was very good. It's, mm -hmm. of course, like many inner city, and that's, I would con mm -hmm. consider that almost inner city. It is now. Uh, uh, the quality of education, I think, has deteriorated, and uh, I don't think the high school is quite as good as it used to be. Okay, but you did well enough that MIT just went, went ahead and took you. Okay, yeah. now, uh, and then, when you got to MIT, did you find that you were well prepared for the classes, or did you have to catch up? No, I wasn't well, well prepared, but I had to really work in my work very hard mm -hmm. <laughs> in order to keep up. Most, I would say, a good percentage of the students that went to MIT went at least a, a year and maybe two years to another college, mm -hmm. and then transferred in. So they had a quite a background uh, mm -hmm. advantage over me. Right. Just well, as they, I, I, I squeezed through. <laughs> okay, you got through. All right. And, and what degree did you take? I, I did, it was just a bachelor's degree in mm -hmm. basically in automotive engineering. Okay. 
All right. And what year did you graduate? 1940. Okay. And what did you do after you graduated? The first job I took was uh, with a company down in Providence, Rhode Island, called the Universal Winding Company, and uh, they they had a quite a program for new graduates where they would train them in all the different aspects of the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. We work in the machine shop. We work in the drafting department. We work in the front of me, we do it with soda. And, and, and the background sounded good to me, so I, I went down there. Until Let's see, I'm just trying to figure out now what happened then. Uh, This, that job was in Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, just about every weekend I used to go up to Cambridge and see my old buddies and visit mm -hmm. and so forth. And uh, the word got around up there that one of the professors that I had, was his name was Carl Fernstrom, was appointed the... Uh, general manager of a newly formed ship yard sponsored by Newport News Shipbuilding Company, which was in Newport News, Rhode Island. But, well, th but this, well, well, Newport uh, News is Newport in Virginia. Newport News, uh, Virginia. Right. Yeah. Uh, but this shipyard was being built in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. And uh, when I went down there to look at it, uh, the gentleman that was showing me around pointed to the empty acreage down there and said, we're going to build a shipyard there and we're going to build Liberty ships because we're going to be getting in a war and we'll need all the ships we can to get the personnel and the war material over to Europe. So that sounded interesting, and I stayed down there for three years mm -hmm. until I got a little antsy. I wanted to get involved in the in the war okay. and not build ships back home. So I went up to Raleigh, North Carolina, and signed up at the Navy station up there uh, as an ensign. All right, and they sent me to Princeton. Well, officers training school. Okay. I want to back up a little bit and fill in some of that time period. Sure. All right. So were you already uh, in North Carolina when Pearl Harbor happened? Yes, I was. Okay. December the 7th, I was there. And do you remember how you heard about Pearl Harbor? How I did? Yeah. How did you learn about it? Uh, basically over the radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, now you were already now I, because of what you were doing, you were already aware of the possibility that we could get into the war. Yes, because they told you that. Now, were you expecting to, a war with Japan, or were you just thinking about Europe? Would you say that again? Were you expecting a war with Japan, or were you mostly thinking about Europe? I guess we were thinking of the, the entire picture. Okay, Europe. Uh, of course, we had already. We hadn't been officially in the war with, mm -hmm. with Europe, but uh, you know we were helping everybody over there. Mm -hmm. Certainly helping Great Britain. Right. And uh, so then, then I got, then I wanted to get involved in right. that. So right. So, uh, so the job that you had basically gave you a deferment. Oh yes, you I had a deferment. Yes. Okay. Stay there as long as you wanted to. Yes. Okay. Now, do you think it was still in 1943 that you signed up, or would it have been 44 before you actually went? I think I signed up in 43, the end of 43. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was called to active duty uh, in 44. Right. The beginning of 44. Okay. Okay. Now take us back. So, where did you do your Navy training? You, you sign up as an ensign, but then they have to train you, don't they? Yes, I went to officer's training school in Princeton. 
Okay. Princeton, New Jersey. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and what did that training consist of? Well, we had to know all the aspects of navigation and all the all the other things that went along in in trying in trying to become a you know a satisfactory officer. All right. Um, on a practical level, I mean, did they teach you? Were they teaching you anything about seamanship and navigation and yes. that kind of yes. thing? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, and then, did they also? I mean, the the enlisted men when they come in, there's a lot of emphasis on, on drill and discipline and all of this kind of thing. Did they do that with the officer candidates? Well, the officers all went to college, and mm -hmm. the enlisted men went to. Uh, Naval training schools. Right. Uh, one where we went, went down to finally to pick up our crew mm -hmm. was in uh, Camp Bradford outside of Norfolk uh, down in Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's where we put the crew together. Right. I guess I was asking if when they were training you as officers, uh, did they do any of the spit and polish stuff that the enlisted men had to do? You know, how you wore your uniform, that kind of thing. Oh, very much so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, when you finished, and how long did your training at Princeton last? I think three months. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then what did they do with you after you finished that? Well, they sent, sent us down to uh, Camp Bradford. Okay down in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And what were you doing there? Well, there we got out, we, we put our, or they put, our crew together. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, the crew that was going to be on an LST, plus all the officers that were going to be there. Mm -hmm. And we trained together. We, not only did we have, like, classroom studies, but we had, uh, went out on LSTs out in the Chesapeake Bay and practiced uh, running the ship. And uh, so finally they said, you're on your own. And we were, on, we were on the way for, well, down the Mississippi River. Okay. Well, that was when you got your, your own LST, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We got on, we got on a train at, uh, at uh, at Camp Bradford and went to uh, Seneca, Illinois, mm -hmm. where where they were building L LSTs. Right. And then took it all down the river, okay. Mississippi. All right. Uh, now, at this at this point, what is your actual assignment on the ship? There are several officers, so what job do you have? I, I was the engineering officer. So I was the one. I had more engineering training than anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what is. And, and some officers, you know. Uh, then we had a gunnery officer, we had a navigation officer, and we had uh, a general officer who was in charge of supplying the ship, for mm -hmm. example. Right. Okay. And so what does the engineering officer do? Yeah, well. He personally doesn't do anything. He tells all the guys what to do. <laughs> but our job was to keep all the machinery running. Mm -hmm. That's it. And uh, because an LST basic function was to carry troops and vehicles, tanks, for example, and uh, just go full speed ahead and ram them up on the on the beach mm -hmm. open the, open the big doors in front and disembark them mm -hmm. so you're responsible for all of those kinds of op all the machinery and the doors and all of that stuff e everything that yes as well as the engines themselves oh yeah, yeah. yeah. okay all right uh, now what do you remember about the trip down the Mississippi Oh, 
I guess getting the first taste of being down the engine room and uh, watching how things operated, what had to be done to make sure they were doing in good shape. Mm -hmm. Couldn't afford any breakdowns. Now, what time of year were you on the Mississippi? Uh, I think the, you've got that, I guess, in your chronology there. It's probably on here. Yeah, so I guess you... So it looks like the end of October when you actually start October, sailing. Uh, I guess October. Mm -hmm. October, 26th of October, we right. started down. And yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, do you remember if the uh, you had to watch out for running aground or anything like that since you yeah, were sailing? Yeah, we, we, we weren't allowed, to, and rightfully so. To navigate it ourselves. Mm -hmm. The Mississippi is a very tricky river. Got a lot of twists and turns. A lot of sand. A lot of shoals. Shoals and, and so you had to take on a pilot. Mm -hmm. So a pilot stayed with us the whole time and steering us down the river or or, or his particular section which he was most familiar with. Right. And we get another pilot and mm -hmm. take the rest of the way until we got to New Orleans. Okay. Uh, now, were all of your crew uh, new men, or did you have some experienced sailors with you? Oh, I would say 90% of them were new. We had some some guys that came from another ship, mm -hmm. but basically uh, putting the crew together, most of them, most of them were brand new. Okay. All right. And now you get down to New Orleans. Um, do you get to go ashore there, or do you just go off to sea? No, we we had to store the ship up because going down the Mississippi, we tried to keep the ship as light as possible, mm -hmm. and we there were no guns on the ship. Anything with any weight, right, was removed. Any any of the dry goods or anything we had was taken off. The guns were taken off. The ammunition was taken off. So when we were in New Orleans. All that had to be put back on again. Mm -hmm. And then when that was all done, we went down the Mississippi. New Orleans is about, I guess, 50, 60 miles up the river. Mm -hmm. So we had to go down the river into the Gulf, and we practiced steaming around the Gulf mm -hmm. in convoy with some other Velestes, uh, practicing landing on the beach until everybody, whoever was in charge, figured, okay, you guys can do it by yourself now. Mm -hmm. And they sent us off to the South Pacific. Okay. Now, before you left for the South Pacific, did they load up the LST with all of what you were going to take with you across the ocean? Yeah. Because on a shakedown cruise, you probably weren't carrying a lot of troops and extra equipment. Yes. Yeah. So you'd have to go back and get those and then leave. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, now, was there anything, do you remember what you were carrying as you crossed the Pacific? Uh, did you have any unusual cargo or? Part of the unusual cargo was, of all things, telephone poles. Okay. <laughs> we had a bunch of them on board. And then, um, did you carry, uh, okay, so I guess, the, so initially you go from New Orleans, you go to the Panama Canal? Did you go through the Panama Canal? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. And what do you remember about that? Well, it was very, very interesting maneuvers going through the canal with the, with the locks and everything and mm -hmm. filling them up with water and then emptying them and in order to get over the, the ridges in the, in the, ter in the terrain. Mm -hmm. so. okay. Now, did the, any of the crew get to go ashore at one end oh, of the yes. 
All right. Everybody got ashore and uh, had a few days down there. I remember going, taking the train from where we were docked on the Atlantic side. You can you could take a train and it could take you all the way over to the Pacific side. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting little trip. It wasn't a big yeah. trip, I don't know, 50 miles or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was very interesting. All right. Uh, now, did you have to worry about some of the men going into bars and having that kind of thing? Well, I think we you always worry about them, and you're always pulling some of them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to go down the next morning and get them out of jail. <laughs> now, was that something a junior officer would do sometimes? No, they had... Uh, they had MPs that are mm -hmm. permanently stationed there, you know. Okay. Take, well, wherever there's a bunch of sailors around, and, mm -hmm. and even the officers <laughs> watching out for them that they don't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Okay, so you get to Panama, and then from Panama, what's your next stop? I'm going to walk over. San Diego. Okay. Yeah. And then did you load anything new at San Diego, or was that just... Fuel and food. That was uh, pretty much. Uh, we were pretty much loaded up by that mm -hmm. time. Okay. And then from there we went over to Hawaii. All right. Now in, in Hawaii, the biggest thing that happened there is we took another amphibious landing craft, an, an LCT, mm -hmm. and hoisted, and it was hoisted up on our main deck. And we carried that little landing craft mm -hmm. all the way over to Okinawa, actually. Okay. When the, we had to t tip the ship over on its side and slide it off into the water. Because it's an LC ticket stuff. It's a flat-bottomed craft with a ramp on the front. Yeah. But it can carry like four vehicles or something, yeah. four tanks, something. Yeah. yeah. So it's bigger than the little Higgins boats the men land in. It's a yeah. more substantial landing craft, but it's not an ocean going craft. No. So you were carrying it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well now, actually they did take them over the ocean individually too. Okay. Yeah. But they're probably not very fast. But uh, it took a long time. Yeah. And it was uh Pretty rough ride, I imagine. I mm -hmm. never was on one, but right. okay. So you got that kind of sitting right there in the middle of your, of your deck. Now, inside the ship, did you have uh, vehicles or? Because I think there's something here about having LVTs on the tank deck, and those are amphibious landing vehicles. Okay. Yeah. Which one was it? The LVTs. LVT. Yeah. yeah. That's the that's the smaller one. That would take maybe just only one. Yeah. I think an LVT is a tracked vehicle. It's like a amphibious tank almost, but that carries men. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So you've got plenty of stuff, um, and so you leave Pearl Harbor, and we've got that. Um, And then you head across the Pacific from there. It's going to be late yes. January. You, you leave. Yes, down to Tula, down to the Solomon Islands. Okay. Now, in the process, you you cross the equator. Yes. Okay. Did your ship have a ceremony for crossing the equator, or did they not do that? A ceremony? Yeah. Oh, I'll say. Can you describe the ceremony? Well, I think if the Japanese had seen us with the shenanigans that went on aboard the ship. They would have uh, surrendered right then and said, those guys are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all the all right. spray deal with uh, different uh, solutions like a, a mustard or something like that. Wash your mouth out with uh, soapy water and all the... Halloween kind of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I know I had to put on some long underwear 
We carried long underwear, by the way, mm -hmm. in case the LSC was assigned to, say, the Aleutian Islands right. or something like that. Uh, and I was given the long... Uh, periscope, so I could, uh, or tele telescope, rather. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and my job was to try to find the uh, the uh, what is it? Uh, the equator. So my job was for trying to find that. I, I never did find it. Mm -hmm. But it was all that, all those kinds of shenanigans, and uh, the flag that was flown was a, a pirate's flag. Uh, we would have scared anybody that saw us. Wonder mm -hmm. what's what's going on. <laughs> all right. Now, did the captain have to go through this too, or no, had he been no. across already? No, no. The captain and the executive officer probably was still up on, on the on the deck. Of, on the uh, in the wheelhouse, right? Making sure that we weren't running into any other ships because mm -hmm. we weren't by ourselves. Okay. We were, I don't, I, I forget how many were with us, but maybe a half a dozen. Okay. LSCs. So you're sailing in a convoy. Uh, yeah. Yes, and we got down to the Solomon Islands. Mm -hmm. and then, okay, and what happened once you got there? Once we got there, we again did a, an awful lot of practicing with other LSTs in. Uh, getting ready for the inevitable landings that were going to take place on the islands mm -hmm. because MacArthur was goal was to proceed to Japan uh, with a, an island jumping mm -hmm. process rather than take every island that she mm -hmm. went up he, he was going around the islands. And so what we were doing, we were practicing and practicing and practicing again until we finally loaded up with uh, some Marines. I guess there were Marines at the time by the Army. And uh, went up to another place in, we went. in preparation for yeah. Yeah, Ulithi Atoll is what you've got listed here. Ulithi in the Caroline Islands. Ulithi. Yeah. Yeah, Ulithi. All right. Well, that's kind of an assembly point. Yes. Okay. And very, now... Very big, very big atoll. And a lot, a lot of ships could uh, be anchored in there mm -hmm. quite safely. And uh, until we were ready to go to Okinawa. Okay. Uh, now, tell us about the, tr the trip to Okinawa. Uh, how large was the fleet around you, or what did you see? Well, it was a tremendously large fleet. I never saw any gathering of ships that was quite that large. And uh, we're getting ready for uh, April the 1st. Mm -hmm. And then we were, I think they called it Yellow Beach 1 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, That's what they, are they listing Yellow Beach 2 on the chronology two? here? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, and so what does your ship do, what does your LST do initially? What we did in that particular case, we, we had uh, big pontoons on the side of, mm -hmm. each side of the ship, which well, well, first thing we we did was, I guess, get rid of that L, LCT, mm -hmm. and and then we dropped the pontoons off, and the pontoons were tied, stern to, you know, head, head on, mm -hmm. and uh, and then a bulldozers in the front, and you get as close to the beach with the pontoon as you could. Uh, and then uh, bulldozers would make a, a ramp like up, mm -hmm. to, up to these pontoons and uh, if you had tanks, the tanks would roll off. If you had 
armored vehicles, they would roll off. Mm -hmm. All right. And you had your LVTs and your Marines to unload. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, on that first day, um, did you get fired upon or see enemy aircraft, or was it quiet? No, it was quite, quite, quite quiet the first day. And then later on, it, uh, the kamikazes then started coming over. Okay. Well, after you unloaded um, the Marines and the LBTs and so forth, um, did you just stay at Okinawa, or did you go back and get more supplies and come back? No, we stayed there mm -hmm. for a while so that we could, so if the need arose, that we could take the, the Marines off one section of beach and mm -hmm. go around the other end of the island, which okay. we did. Okay. Uh, to another section and dump them off there so that we could go around the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we kept doing that for a month, I guess it was. And then we left there. We damaged our propeller at one place where we were trying to get in on a beach and we ran the ship into a reef and uh, bent several blades, I guess, on the, on the uh, propellers, and we couldn't uh, maintain full speed. We had to cut back on the speed quite a bit to prevent some further damage to the internal combustion engines, which was the same engine used in locomotives, by the way, about a thousand horsepower. Okay. So we had to go back. I, th I forget where we went after that. It says the Philippines. To the Philippines. To Leyte, yeah. And had to get uh, into a dry dock. And the, uh, I guess the propellers were either exchanged or repaired in mm -hmm. some way they were fixed. All right, now before that, you had been under attack by kamikazes. Yeah. Okay, can you describe what that was like or what happened to your ship? Well, that was the most dangerous thing, was the kamikazes. And, uh, of course, in the daytime, they fired on them all the time. And actually, those LSCs can put up quite a wall of fire. You get a whole bunch of them out there all shooting at those airplanes, you can knock quite a few of them out of the sky. And at night time when they came over, we had what they called fog machines, and you put up a blanket of fog where you just, you hid in the, in the fog, they couldn't see you, you couldn't see them, so you just sat there, covered with a whole bunch of fog. Okay, so what do the kamikazes do at that point? Do they just drive into the fog and hope to hit something? Well, they were uh, just dropping bombs down at that time, I would imagine. Well, I imagine. well a kamikaze was sort of designed to go one direction and, and not actually land anywhere. Now, they had regular bombers as well. Yeah. So they had regular aircraft, and maybe that's what they used at night. Yeah. So if you don't remember a bunch of kamikazes plunging into the water at night, no. then probably that was bombers they were using. No, no. Yeah. But the kamikazes were going to fly directly into your ship. Yes. Now, how close did your ship get to being hit by a kamikaze? Quite close, and it was uh, Sid Langer that his gun crew, he and Goldie, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. were on the gun crew that uh, shot down a kamikaze that almost got us. Mm -hmm. And I, I think as he was as it, as it was coming towards us, uh, the pilot apparently was hit with something and pulled back. Just jerked backwards mm -hmm. from the reaction from the gun, and uh, went up and over the ship. Actually, or we wouldn't we wouldn't be sitting here talking. Yeah, because <coughs> he would have come right into the side of the ship, mm -hmm. right where the engine room was. Okay, and right where John o. Lutz was. <laughs> okay, so the, as engineering officer, your general quarter station would be un with in the engine room? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, now, did you ever observe kamikaze attacks from on deck, or were you always down below? 
No, once in a while when it seemed to be a little bit slowing down in the activity, uh, we would, a couple of time, would go up and take a look around. Mm -hmm. And then when it got a little more active, they scoot down the engine room again. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay, so you kind of, so you're off of Okinawa during April, you go back to the Philippines to get repaired. Um, now, it looks like in your chronology here that you're there from 29th of April to the 23rd of June. So how did you spend your time in the Philippines then? Did you have duties on board ship or did you go ashore? A little of both, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I remember going ashore, mm -hmm. and uh, the men went ashore. They had a little time on, in Manila, and a couple other, couple of other islands there. Cebu was one, and mm -hmm. Mindanao was another one, and there's, but there was, there was a few islands that we visited. Did you see much of the Filipino population, or? Yeah, they were out, going out about their business, and just trying to think of what. I think things were. I think the people tried to get along as much as the best they could. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, in the villages and the towns around there, little, little shanties, little shacks were open for selling goods and mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables and things like that. And did they seem to like the Americans? or? Well, I think they looked as, at us like their savior, you know, mm -hmm. after all, it was either us or somebody. Yeah, or the Japanese. And... Right. And, uh, they didn't have much love for the Japanese. Okay. Now, did you get to Manila yourself? Did I what? Did you go to Manila? Yes. Okay. And what did you see there? Oh, a lot of the buildings were just in shambles, really. They were, as a result of our gunfire and the Japanese gunfire. Mm -hmm. which was, the Japanese had, was it? was in charge there. And then when they, when they evacuated it, they, they blew up a lot of the buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, so you have some time in the Philippines and then you load back up again. Um, and so how do you spend um, the last month or so of the war? So kind of July of 45 into August, were you moving well, we, were getting, we were really getting ready to go into Japan, mm -hmm. you know. The, uh, I guess it was on the schedule to be the next one until they, uh, until they dropped the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. And do you remember hearing news of the bomb being dropped? Yeah, it came over the radio, of course. Okay. And, it, at, and at the moment it happened, did you understand what that meant, or was it really only when the Japanese surrender that you figure it out? I guess we didn't realize how devastating something like that could be. Uh, the biggest thing in our minds was the war was over, we were going to go home. Mm -hmm. That was number one. And, uh, and, uh, Okay. So before that, were you moving supplies around to get ready for the invasion? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, after the Japanese surrender, uh -huh. now what does your LST do? Well, then our task became to get the Japanese soldiers back home. The quicker they went back home, the less of a problem Japan would be. Mm -hmm. they, could, they, they could go to work. They could go back to farming if they were farming. They could go back and try to rebuild some of the factories and 
they wouldn't be quite the burden that if we just left them alone. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a wise move to get as many as you could, get them back home. And that little booklet that I mm -hmm. made there is uh, one whole one whole trip from Palau, which mm -hmm. was some uh, islands down there in the South Pacific, mm -hmm. taken home this whole uh, group of Japanese soldiers and uh, depositing them in okay. out, outside Tokyo, actually. All right. Now, in your chronology here, that comes in, in December uh, of 45, but you've been to Japan already before that. Because you went to Yokohama earlier. Because your chronology says that you went to Manila at the end of August, picked up the 118th Engineer Combat Battalion, mm -hmm. and took them to Yokohama. Uh -huh. okay. Oh, okay, do you remember doing that? No, I don't. I, and then, 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 yeah, then, then we went up to uh, another island called Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. We did that and took a group up there. And then from Hokkaido, we got a little shore leave. The war was over by that yeah. time. And I, I took I took the train over to Sapporo. Sapporo, by the way, was was headquarters for Winter Olympics at one time. Right. Back in 1972 so, or some six or sometime yeah, like that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're pretty much up on your stuff there. Well, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember that. Yeah. So I watched that one on television. Uh, but yeah, okay. So you, you see, now when you go ashore in Japan, uh, how did the Japanese people behave toward you? I thought they did very good. We, uh, we, had, we had some Jeeps on it that we had confiscated along the way. We had three three jeeps on board the ship. Mm -hmm. uh, we grabbed one to go for a little ride, and and, and I remember we would go along and something would happen to our jeep. They come running out of the house and fix it or whatever mm -hmm. it was, or change a tire, and uh, no, they were very. Uh, when the, Jap when the Japanese emperor said, stop fighting, they stopped fighting right then and there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we could drive all over with no problems at mm -hmm. all. Went downtown Japan, and then downtown Tokyo, mm -hmm. went through several of the big stores that were still operating. Mm -hmm. Most of the, most of Tokyo was destroyed by the uh, the, the fires. Mm -hmm. With uh, we used to drop incendiary bombs on them. Mm -hmm. By far, we killed more people that way than with, uh, with the atomic bombs. Explosives, yeah. Yeah. Did it surprise you at all that the Japanese were as friendly as they were? I guess it did. It really did, because they really, they could have killed any one of us. Mm -hmm. And nobody would have really known it, only that we didn't show up on the ship that night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember we, on one little uh, Jeep expedition that we were driving around, uh, we put a couple of cans of sardines in a knapsack and so that if we got hungry along the way we could stop and, and eat, which we did. I think there's about two or three of us in a, in a jeep. Mm -hmm. And we sat down on the curb and uh, opened up the sardines we were eating them. And the Japanese ladies in the house that was there came out with tea served as tea. <laughs> Didn't know whether to take it or not, but but they were very, very courteous. You'll find out reading that little write-up that I have there, what a perfect gentleman the, uh, I think he was a 
Colonel, uh, the the ja Colonel uh, Japanese, the commander of the Japanese unit yeah. who were moving, yeah. Right. Okay. What, what a perfect gentleman he was and uh, kept his troops on board ship under control and uh, wrote a nice little, nice little letter there, mm -hmm. which uh, I got a copy of the there. original, thanking us for bringing him home, even though I think he said three of them died on the way. Couldn't put them all on, on the tank deck that was full. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them just had to stay up on the on the main deck. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the food they had was uh, rice. And you'll see pictures there of our cooks, with the help of their cooks, mm -hmm. scooping out rice into the okay. little all containers. Right. Let's talk a little bit more fully here about that that last trip. So you go down to Palau, uh, which is going to pass the Philippines, I guess, uh, or south of there a little bit. Uh, and Palau, that larger set of islands, one of the islands in that area was Peleliu, yes, where the Marines had fought a very tough battle. But the main yeah. island, uh, Palau itself, I guess, is where you went to. Yeah. And there was a Japanese unit there that had been the garrison that was still there at the end of the war. Right. So your job was to take them home. Right. Okay. So uh, sort of take us through the sequence of events. The LST comes into the harbor at Palau. Right. And then what happens? Well, I guess nothing much. They, they all came down to the docks there. Mm -hmm. And their officers, you know, directed them on board the ship. And mm -hmm. you'll see... One of our guys standing there telling, directing him to go here, go there, and so forth, and no problem, no problem at all. Mm -hmm. Again, that, that's the interesting thing. When they said, stop fighting, they stopped fighting. What physical condition were they in? Did they look healthy and well-fed, or were they kind of thin? Or I guess I didn't look too closely at that time. I was looking at other things. Mm -hmm. But I would think that uh, one of the problems on those islands, where they couldn't get supplies from their own fleet, uh, would be a lack of food. Mm -hmm. Although I don't know why they didn't fish. <laughs> you know? Oh, they might have. They might have, in addition to that. But, uh, no, they were just packing up their gear, mm -hmm. folding blankets. You can see them folding blankets there. And, and going, just going on board ship and one little space it would be, they'd sit down there and I'd be there till they got home. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, did any of them speak English? Not that I recall. Okay. And did you have anybody on board who spoke Japanese? No. Okay. So you just kind of had to communicate as best you could? No, the, the, I say anybody, the, the colonel did. Okay. The one in charge did. Mm -hmm. He did. There were two of them that, that were in charge, actually. Okay. And uh, you can see his picture in there. He's a very distinguished looking guy. Mm -hmm. And he spoke English. He may have even gone to school in the United States, mm -hmm. a lot, as a lot of them did. You yeah. Know. All right. Um. And then when you were taking them back up to Japan, I mean, did you have bad weather or? Did yes, we did. We had, an, and I got some pictures of the bad weather we got there. And uh, everybody got sick as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, they, more frequently than our sailors, who were more used to that than mm -hmm. the land-based troops, you know. Right. So when you first went to sea, did you get seasick? I never got really seasick, no. Not really bad. I, I'd feel a little squeezy, mm -hmm. but uh, some guys got really seasick and of course what they wanted to do was lie down and well, if they lie down somebody else has to take their watch. Yeah. So we wouldn't allow that. No lying down. The only thing you could do is, uh, and, we, and they did that quite often, is they take a, a gallon. A lot of the Food came in gallon, tomatoes would come in a gallon mm -hmm. can or something, mm -hmm. and we'd tie a gallon can with a string around their neck, 
so they'd have some place uh, we didn't want it in the bilges, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Or, or on the on the deck. But, but after a few days of uh, getting used to rolling around, mm -hmm. there was a couple that they they were either fooling or not. Uh, had to be transferred off on occasion, mm -hmm. not that particular place, but any other place. Yeah, because they were just aller just allergic to it. They couldn't stand it. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had a pharmacist mate on board ship, and uh, he's the guy that used to dole out the the shots and check everybody to make sure they were all right and mm -hmm. do what he could for them. Uh, he was even also trained to do minor operations. The uh, the ward room, which is the dining room for the officers, had a big table on it where we ate, because that that became the operating table. We never had to use it, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. But uh, he would, if you, if somebody had appendicitis, he was at least trained to to do something mm -hmm. about staying in the pain, I guess. Now, did the ship ever have any combat casualties? Did anybody ever get hit with shrapnel no. or bullets, things like that? No. Okay. <coughs> they never did. Okay. So, um, after you dropped off the Japanese prisoners, you get back to Tokyo Bay, unload them. Now what happens to you and, and the LST? To me? Yeah. We were just sitting in the harbor up there. Mm -hmm. I think we made one trip up to Otoru, okay. which was the port near Hokkaido, mm -hmm. where you could get a train actually and go up to Sapporo. Right. And uh, that's about, made one trip up there, as I recall, and just hung around the harbor a little bit for a few days mm -hmm. until we got uh, word that the uh, Japanese uh, merchant marine was going to take it over. Okay, so we're helping rebuild Japan by giving them the LST. Yeah, okay. so they, uh, they got the LST. All right. And uh, our guys spent half the time switching uh, cages around, trying to fool them so they <laughs> wouldn't know what cage to watch down the engine room. <laughs> sort of nasty, but... Yeah, okay. Uh, so now, from there, do you get sent back home? Yes, and I mm -hmm. came back home. Okay, and how did you get home? Because your ship is still well, in Japan. Yeah. Uh, let's see now. I was I was uh, I asked my captain to give me a pass to discharge me right there in uh, Tokyo, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> I, could, I used that to go over to the airport, and uh, I bummed a ride home on a transport that was gone, taking some uh, Washington officials back to Washington, actually. Okay. And uh, I got a ride all the way to Midway, I guess it was Midway, mm -hmm. and then the next hop I got was uh, the Philippines, and then from the Philippines I got another hop over to uh, outside San Francisco, some place over there. I forget what the name of the airport yeah. was. Do you think you see so you went from Midway to the Philippines? Because that'd be the wrong direction. No, I went to... Uh, or did you go Philippines to Midway and then home? Yeah. Philippines. No, I didn't go to the Philippines. Okay. No. All right. I went to, uh, to Midway right over. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it was from Tokyo from Tokyo to Midway. That would make sense, yeah. Uh, Midway to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Hawaii over to uh, San Francisco, someplace okay. over there. Yeah. And then from there to Kansas. Olathe, Olathe, Kansas. Olathe, Kansas. Olathe, Kansas. And from Kansas was the last hop I got. 
and that landed in Washington, D.C. Yeah. All right. Uh, Washington, and Washington, D.C. Yeah, where I, where I took the train. Where I took the train up to uh, to Philadelphia, because that's where I was living at the time, mm -hmm. time I went into the service. Okay. Because I guess you, I thought you had been working in North Carolina, or had they... No, I had been, work, I had been, I had been working at the that Baldwin Locomotive Works, where we were okay. making uh, engines, actually the same engine. Mm -hmm. Right. Was made in, in these uh, locomotive companies as uh, appeared in a lot of these ships. All right. Okay. So now that you're out of the Navy, it's 1946, Navy. Uh, now what do you do? I went to work uh, at the Baldwin Locomotive Works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went back to, I went back to them. Okay, and how long did you stay with them? Not too long, because I had a job. I had a job offer to go someplace else, to uh, to a company that that offered me a chief engineer job, and we made uh, piston rings. Which was in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which was finally acquired by Excello Corporation. And Excello Corporation was finally acquired by Textron, mm -hmm. which is still, I guess they're still active in the, in the, the area here. The Detroit area, supplying parts to the uh, automobile company, and that's it. And I retired from there. Okay. Now, along the way, though, uh, you stayed in the Naval Reserves when you came out. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so, what happens when the Korea after the Korean War starts? After what? When the Korean War starts. Oh. Yeah. Well. I was in the reserve, of course, and the reason you stayed in the reserve, I did it for the money, actually. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I was young and just got married, and every dollar that you could make was welcome. Mm -hmm. So now, basically, I stayed in the reserve. And, uh, but then when the war came, <clears throat> you know, they grabbed me and put me on the... On the put me on the Adria. Okay. And what kind of ship was the Adria? The Adria was a refrigerated cargo ship. And that was a one, one big ice box, you mm -hmm. know. And the job was to go around to the Atlantic. The further away we went was, I guess, down in, we went to uh, Africa. And we went down to uh, Trinidad, Trinidad was a base, Bermuda, Agentua, which was up in Newfoundland, mm -hmm. uh, picking up picking up s supplies in Nor in the Norfolk area. There's a big naval supply depot mm -hmm. in Norfolk. We pick up the frozen goods and everything and take it up to wherever. The next stop was. Mm -hmm. now, did you go to Europe or just Africa and the Caribbean? No, we went to Africa. It was uh, Casablanca. Okay, so Morocco, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but you didn't go to England or France or no, Italy. No. no. Okay. No. All right. Uh, and uh, what was your job on board that ship? Same thing, engineering officer. Okay. Uh, now, were the other officers World War II veterans, or were they younger? Some were and some weren't. Okay. Mm. All right. 
And, and how long was your obligation to stay on that ship? Two years. Okay. Uh, and so what did your family do during those two years? What? What did your family do during those two years? Did your wife just stay at home and... Yeah. Okay. And mm -hmm. could you, did you have much contact while you were away? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, see, the, the, Ad, the, Adria, the Adria's headquarters was Norfolk. Mm-hmm. Newport News in that area. Yeah. That's where that big naval supply depot was. Right. But we would we were tied up in at the Norf Norfolk Naval Base quite a few times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite a bit. And uh, then I, and I was in charge of uh, I guess I was the senior watch officer. So I used to assign what watches, what officers stood. Mm -hmm. And I always worked it out that I had the weekends off. Because while they, their families were in Norfolk, because mm -hmm. they were, a lot of them were Navy men, mm -hmm. uh, my family was in Philadelphia. And uh, I used to leave f Friday afternoon and don't get back until uh, oh Sunday night mm -hmm. or Monday Monday morning early. So I got home quite a bit then, put in my time until the two years was up. Okay. Now you stayed in the reserves after that. Yes. Okay. Uh, now. And, yeah. So how long did you stay in? Twenty-two years. Okay. Yeah, because I guess it has you retiring out in in in, in 1964. Yeah. Okay. Uh